Well, good morning. So good to see all of you here today to celebrate worship so close to Christmas. This is, you can, you can almost just right around the corner. It's great. Uh, and a lot of our folks, of course, are traveling. Last week, uh, it was a little uh, uh, litany going on in the back of the church. You know, that's where we're going to be gone the next couple of weeks because they're with family and friends and such. And others are here because their family and friends are here. So we have guests today that we don't normally have. Um, but you're here because of family and friends. So we are so glad that you're here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, there isn't uh, anything much to um, announce today, except that there's a reception following the service with real food over in the, uh, uh, you know, unlike faith. Food. Yeah, I, I know, I know. It's uh, anyway, over in the uh, fellowship over uh, Eubank Hall. And uh, all, everyone's welcome to come. Uh, we'll ask only a little bit different is that find a seat, we'll have a prayer, and then we'll, we will uh, eat and, uh, and celebrate that. So what a great, uh, great thing to do on this Sunday before Christmas. How many of you are done with all of your shopping? Okay, how many of you know that you're in church and saying things that aren't true might... <laughs> No, I believe you. I know. I, I believe you. There are a lot of people that uh, they really uh, are very, you know, they, they're going to get it done beforehand. All right, here's the other one. How many of you have not started? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be an interesting day uh, to do so. But with all of that in mind, as we gather in this place, we're in the presence of God, and we're going to praise God with uh, music. We're going to uh, sing some of the great carols. We're going to sing one that some of you may not know. And so we'll see how all that goes. But let's take our time now and turn our thoughts and our hearts over to God in prayer.
Prepare the way, O Zion, your Christ is drawing near. Let every hill and valley a level way appear. Greet one who comes in glory, foretold in sacred story. O blessed is Christ that came in God's most holy name. <coughs> Last Sunday, we lit the candle of joy, and we light it and the candles of hope and peace again as we remember that Christ will come and bring us everlasting hope, peace, and joy. The fourth candle of Advent is the candle of love. Its light reminds us of the love that God has for us. Love is patient, love is kind, and envies no one. Love is never boastful or conceited, rude, or selfish. Love is not quick to take offense. It keeps no records of wrongs. It does not gloat over other people's troubles, but rejoices in the right, the good, the true. There's nothing that love cannot face. There is no limit to its faults, to its hopes. To its endurance. Love never fails. Love never ends. We light this last candle today to remind us of how God's perfect love is found in Jesus. So let us join our voices together in prayer. Loving Love God, God, we thank, thank you, you for the gift of love. love. Shown to us perfectly in Jesus Christ our Lord. Help us prepare our hearts to receive him. Bless our worship. Help us to hear and do your word. We ask this in the name of the one born in Bethlehem. Amen. Jesus Christ is 
is Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I will sing of your steadfast love, O God, forever. Let us worship God. And now let's take a moment to greet each other in the name of Jesus Christ.
Thank you all very much. Thank you. While um, our choir director, Babs, is, uh, uh, we're going to mention this later on in the prayer, uh, she, her sister, Diane, is uh, in an um, assisted living uh, place up near Home Depot, and um, she has been um, deteriorating dramatically and is not expected to live much longer. Uh, in fact, every time that she and I talk, uh, Babs and I, she's like, yeah, it just seems like any moment. But her sister is uh, at peace no pain, uh, completely unaware of what's going on, uh, and Babs is with her every moment. So we will be lifting up Babs in prayer. Uh, but meanwhile, the church goes on, and so we, uh, we, we turn to, to within the choir, and of course, eminently uh, capable and uh, an expert director herself, Raylynn Dobson, is uh, standing in for Babs, and will be doing so until... <laughs> Thank you.
like you so much. Well, now we go to God's word and we begin with the Gospel of Luke. Of course, it is Christmas time, so we always go to the Gospel of Luke for that. And we begin with the uh, 39th verse of the uh, first chapter. <clears throat> At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Mar Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her and will be, that will be accomplished. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Then we go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Isaiah. Uh, beginning with uh, in the seventh chapter, beginning with the tenth verse. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reflect the wrong and to choose the right. This is the word of the Lord. Let's turn to God for a moment of silent prayer. Well, when I asked how many of you have finished your shopping, well, quite a few of you did, but when I asked how many of you have not started it, I think Deborah and I were the only ones who put our hands up. I don't know, I don't know what happened this year, but it really has been kind of crazy to, to do it. And so what is this afternoon going to be? A search, right? Everybody here has been searching before, during, and then of course what happens next week? after Christmas sales. Don't you people keep up? When Christmas is over, you get to go shopping for other stuff that the people didn't buy the first time, or even better, they bring back, and then you get a discount. Yeah, okay, you know, you know how it works. Everybody is searching for something. Some people have vague, good feelings about all of it, and the thing that they're searching for are those vague, good feelings about the past. You know, those Christmases that you spent when everything was just fine and the kids were home and it was easy to cook and find a turkey and all those things or whatever, whatever the tradition is for you, that's what you're searching for. Growing up in Miami, I'm searching for 80 degree weather and Santa Claus wearing shorts and, and flip flops because that's what I grew up with. Yeah, not exactly a Hallmark card moment, but that's what, what we look for, that that which we are familiar is out there. Others are uh, tr just trying to find how can this season become significant to me again? What does the season mean? And I realized when you're standing there that we're gonna, we haven't sung our hymn, have we? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to go sit down, but it, it depends on you. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm, 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 all in the meantime, though, we need to contemplate what it means to love. 
which means love me because I just messed up the service. Please, let us, <laughs> let's stay seated though, stay seated for this beautiful song. So the front of your bulletin has a beautiful candle, the last of the uh, Advent candles. And what does it say? Love. It says love. And we say this Sunday in the season of Advent for the last Sunday because I think it's one of the things that we are all searching for in one way or another. It is a time where Christmas really comes to heart and what it is that we're looking for. We want hope and faith and joy but love really wraps them all together, doesn't it? And so we do everything we can to try to find it. Love itself came down at Christmas. That's what happened on that day so many years ago. And it happens every day to you and me. Love comes down, the love of God in the form of a little baby. There's a story of a little fellow who's told about his new baby sister. He was, to say the least, not much impressed. And he went to school the following day, and his teacher said, Well, I hear you have a new member of the family. Oh, yeah, he said. Well, what's the matter? His teacher asked. Aren't you happy to have a new baby sister? And he said, Well, yeah, I guess, but there were a lot of other things we needed more. <laughs> but I'm sure that when people hear the Christmas story, perhaps for the very first time, their initial reaction is that the world, what the world needs most, is really not another baby. But how wrong they are. Someone has said that whenever God wants something done in this world, he has a baby born. And we know that that is true of the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. The, the prophet had spoken of it. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So we gather together today acknowledging the fulfillment of that prophecy. The Messiah is born to Mary and Joseph in this little town of Bethlehem. And it was in a stable that he was born. It's a strange place for the nativity of the king of kings. I mean, it's a plain and shabby surroundings for the birth of a Messiah. I was reading some time back about a South African diamond miner. They found this beautiful diamond. It was large. And they needed to send it back to London to their head office. And so the uh, mine owner had this metal box built and they put it into it and sealed it up. And four armed men got on a boat to take this to London. And it was never by itself. Even when it was in the ship safe, two armed men stood by the safe the entire way. And they get it to London and they open it up and inside of the box, no diamond. Just a big piece of coal. And two days later, a cardboard box arrived at the office, and in the cardboard box was 
the diamond. The, the uh, uh, owner of the mine figured that nobody's going to mess with a cardboard box when there's a steel, perfectly good steel box to, to worry about. And he was right. Think about that, that of all the things that could have happened with Jesus in that first year, that, that first experience in Bethlehem, he came, he arrived in just an ordinary, plain package. That's what took place. I mean, who would think to look in a stable for a, a, a incarnate God? Only a few star-struck shepherds and, and some very tired uh, from travel astrologers took note of what happened in the little tiny town of Bethlehem that night. I mean, why would the world take notice? As far as we know, nobody else heard the angels. Nobody else saw the star. The rest of the world saw only a plain cardboard box, and they could not know that that box contained the advent of love in this violent world. But Joseph knew. Oh, an angel had appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And, of course, Mary knew, too, her amazement and adoration when she sang, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowliest state of his handmaiden. No wonder that the Blessed Virgin has captured the imagination of so many people around the world. There's this old story about a notorious skeptic who, on meeting the local priest, greeted him as follows. Hello, Father, tell me this. What's the difference between Christ's mother and my mother? And the priest says, I don't know, but there's very great differences between their sons. <laughs> yeah. Mary is venerated by millions and millions of Christians because of the uniqueness of her son. She knew that within the plain brown wrappings of a stable and a manger and shepherds and lowing cattle that the world had been changed forever. How? Christina Rossetti put it most memorably, love came down at Christmas. Love so lovely, so divine. Love came down at Christmas. The star and angel gave the sign. So love came down at Christmas. That's the message for today. That's the hymn we're about to sing in just a few moments. Love was born in the manger of Bethlehem. But what kind of love? Well, there are many kinds, of, really lots of kinds. Love for one another, for sure. Love, something that we celebrate right now. That's why many of us are weary from shopping this time of year. You, you know what you do. You try to find just that right gift. But what you're trying to say is, I love you. You, you matter to me. I, I care about you. There was a cartoon not long ago about three little boys coming to the manger seeing bearing gifts. The first two boys came and they brought traditional gifts representing gold and frankincense. And the third little boy came to the baby Jesus with a very large box of disposable diapers. Now, Mary probably would have wished for something like that. But someone, though, in that cartoon had captured love made practical. Christmas is that time of year when we try to say to our family and our friends, you mean something to me. A gift may not be the best way to do it, and certainly gifts are given with many motivations in mind, but for most of us, there is more joy in giving those gifts than it is in receiving. And we get and we need and we take advantage of this opportunity to express our feelings to others in a very concrete way. Hopefully, though, our love is not a narrow and exclusive thing. Christmas usually causes us to be more thoughtful about the needs of other people that we don't even know. It causes us to be more mindful of the needs of those who are less fortunate. I was in um, uh, a uh, Target, and I noticed that there were a lot of firefighters in that Target. And I thought, what, they let them out or something? They, you know, they, they, there's a fire, we're in big trouble because all the firefighters are in here. And then I noticed every one of the firefighters had a child with them. And I thought, well, these are a prolific bunch of firefighters. They all have, all have kids. And then I realized that they were not their kids. It, it was uh, a, a, uh, an organization that was getting toys for these children, gifts for these children. And the firefighters would take them through the store so the children could pick out <laughs> things that they, they wanted. And I thought, that, does that happen any other time of year? I don't think so. 
But people, there was a party that uh, uh, Deborah had, and they, I said, Is it, do we need to bring anything? Do we, are we going to be a gift exchange? And she said, no, no. All that we're supposed to do is take a toy and put it in the box. What a, and then what are we going to do with those toys? No, it wasn't a toy exchange, although I did like the toys. They were pretty cool. But it was to be given away to other people. What, what other time of year do we do that? We try to say to families and friends, you mean something to me. And giving feels so much better than receiving. A baby was left on the doorstep, this has been many, many years now, in Georgetown, Pennsylvania. There, in the house was a widow, and uh, she was the head of the home. She had several children to look after, but she took in this baby that was left at her doorstep, and she loved it like her own. And every evening, she would read from great books to the children. And they loved it, and she loved them. But one of them developed a great taste for literature. And today, that baby who was abandoned on a doorstep is one of America's most prolific writers, James Michener. His life is a triumph, but it's a triumph because of the unselfish love of that widowed mother. That is the kind of love that we celebrate this day. Love for one another. Love for those who are less fortunate. But we also celebrate another kind of love, our love for Jesus Christ. I mean, we're in this room. That's what we're here to do. A young family was going home for Christmas. The, star, the car was all set. You've all done that. You know, you check the tire pressures. You make sure the radiator's full and the oil's been changed. Everything's good. And then you start putting all the gifts in, right? And the trunk is never quite big enough, but you manage to get, you know, Uncle Charlie's socks in there somehow. And, and you got the kids, you know, uh, Tinker Toys. Does anybody get Tinker Toys anymore? Oh, good, because I just went back about 80 years there. Anyway, if the, all, the to, all the toys were in the car. They had everything set. They had uh, set so the timer lights were on. The neighbors were going to watch the dog and get the mail. And all that. Everything was ready for them to go. And they get in the car, and they start it up, and they start backing up. And then the wife says, oh, my God, we forgot the baby. <laughs> and, and they had. They, they'd done everything that they needed, but they forgot to put the baby in the car. It is so easy sometimes to forget that. We see visual reminders of it. Don't let Christ, um, don't, don't leave Christ out of Christmas. And we try to keep that from happening, to, to make the baby the main thing of this celebration. Brennan Manning tells a story that he recounted every Christmas in the forests of Provence in southern France. It's just a wonderful legend. It's about four shepherds who come to Bethlehem to see the child. And according to the story, one of the shepherds brought eggs. Another brought bread and cheese. The third brought wine. And the fourth brought nothing at all. And people called him Lachon. The first three shepherds, they chatted with Mary and Joseph. They commented on how well Mary looked after just giving birth and how Joseph had appointed the cave so nicely. And it was a, it was a beautiful starlit night. And they congratulated the proud parents. They presented them with their gifts. I reassured them, you know, if you need anything at all, we're just over in the field over there. We'll be glad to help you. Finally, somebody said, where's LaShawn? And so they started looking around and looked high and low, in and out. And finally, somebody poked their heads behind the blanket that was there to keep a draft off of the baby. And there kneeling at the creche was LaShawn. And through the entire night, he stayed in adoration, whispering, Yezu, 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 Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Isn't that where you and I would be this morning? Kneeling beside the crib, whispering, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I mean, after all, what else can we offer him? He already reigns over all of creation. What can we bring him? Only our love and our adoration. And we do that gladly. And we offer to Christ our love. But, the most important thing in this world, this Christmas, is not our love for one another, as great as that is, not even our love for Jesus Christ. The most important thing in this world is God's love for us, as exemplified in the birth of his son. In Edinburgh, Scotland, I love this story, a place called the Museum of Childhood is loaded with childhood treasures. Teddy 
teddy bears and puppets and rocking horses and uh, model trains and books and games and doll houses and I mean cases and cases of dolls of every kind, baby dolls, porcelain dolls, costume dolls, walking, talking dolls, dolls that can turn somersaults, expensive dolls, and dolls of privileged children. But off in the corner, there's this little case, and behind the glass pane, another doll sits there. It's all alone, and it's a raggedy doll, which the, much the worse for wear. But then it began its life, raggedy. And that doll was loved, there's no doubt about it. Nor that there was, uh, it was a born, uh, not that it was born of love, for all of its shabbiness, it was shabby the day that it was made. It had and has a value, though, a sign on it says, a doll belonging to a London slum child circa 1905. The doll is unnamed, and the child is unnamed. The doll's body is made of tattered brown socks stuffed with rags. The arms are made from two sticks of wood covered in wool. Its hair is a sock. It wears a plain gingham dress and a rough linen apron. For all its simplicity, it was made with painstaking effort. The head is simply a, the heel of a man's shoe, only that, a worn down, battered heel with the nail head still visible on the edges, and for a face the doll has bits of paper pasted on with paper eyes and a paper nose and a paper mouth, and the mouth is not smiling. Some might call it ugly, but they would be very, very wrong. It is possible the slum child made it for herself. Perhaps it was a gift created by a mother or a father who was poor in possessions, all they could give was love beyond measure. One does not need to have wealth to create something valuable. One only needs to reach deep within themselves where value is defined. One need not have wealth to give a gift. The only need to give is the desire to give, to use whatever poor things are at hand and to make them the best gifts possible. In all the Western world, there were no slums bleaker than the slums of London in 1905. But somewhere in one of those slums, a sad and sorry doll was born. A doll that can bring tears to your eyes because it is just so pitiful. And because it is also so very, very beautiful. If you cannot appreciate the story of that ragged doll, you will have a hard time appreciating the story of Christmas. A diamond wrapped in a plain cardboard box, the Christ child, a pitiful doll that is loved into beauty. That is you. That is us. We are that pitiful doll that is loved into something beautiful. Look at us. I mean, what are we that God should love us so much there is nothing to recommend us nothing but his love and it is that love that came down at Christmas the world might cynically imagine that the last thing that it needs is another baby but that is its greatest need for that baby has brought love into this world and we celebrate that love on th at, during this Christmas time love for one another Love for the Christ child, but do not forget it is the love that is the source of all love, God's love for you. Let us pray. Our Father, we are so aware that you have come to bring what we call love, and we do not understand it. We can't pretend to. We think that love is something that you give to someone else, and it is. But it's such a small part. But we thank you for that. We thank you that we struggle. We thank you that you set the bar so high for us that we can never reach it. But you can, and you do. And your greatest gift, the greatest gift of Christmas, is your love for us. Love that came down at Christmas. Amen. Let's stand and sing. This is There's like four or five different... Um, Verses, I mean, four or five different tunes, but I've chosen the Irish tune because I just, I like it. Let's stand up and sing. No reason at all, I just grabbed it. <laughs>
Please be seated. I have a couple of prayer requests here. Um, okay, th this is a, a reminder. I might as well do this at this time. Um, that the Jesus uh, movie is showing today at 2 o'clock um, in the Fellowship Hall. We, we saw one of these earlier on Esther. They're excellent. Um, uh, it's a play production that is really amazing. 2 o'clock. And this is from um, Wanda. Uh, my neighbor, Ann, who has Alzheimer's, and her husband, Stan, who is her caregiver. Prayers for both of them, please. Yes, we've prayed for this, um, for, for this kind of situation. It's not just enough to pray for the person who's suffering for Alzheimer's, but for the whole support network underneath of them. So we will certainly do that. Thank you, Wanda. Um, Babs and her sister, Diane, please keep them in your prayers. Um, a, a real treat this uh, Christmas Eve is coming up. Um, many of you know Sally Altobello uh, lost her husband, Al, and um, Sally is with us here today somewhere. She's not usually, there she is, okay. Um, she's one of those people that sits in different places unlike every other one of you, you know? <laughs> I really can't tell if you're here or not because I can see, but Sally, um, you know, has sung for this congregation many times. And she actually asked if it would be okay, and I am absolutely delighted and enthusiastic that she'll be sharing uh, with us on uh, Christmas Eve. She'll be singing with us. As a, it's a way to kind of get back into, uh, into life. And so, Sally, we look forward to that. And uh, so, Are there others that we can lift up in prayers today? Then let's turn our thoughts to God. Our Father, we... We run our yearly race to Bethlehem, and many of us are tired from lives that have been too busy and too cluttered. Did you mean it to be that way? I mean, surely you intended for your son's birth to bring us peace and joy and renewal and a sense of togetherness, of being in touch with life's deepest mysteries and realities. Grant that, sorting through the debris of Christmas, we may find that sense of being in touch, may breathe easier, knowing that you are at work in this world, continuing to become incarnate in the acts of love and fellowship begun in your son, Jesus. As we end the, near the end of another year, we pray for the overtures of peace, that they may be finding roots in honest desire to grow an atmosphere of trust and goodwill. We remember those who are poor and ask that we may find ways to help them, to feed them, and to uh, those that are sick to receive healing. We pray for those who are grieving that their hearts may be comforted, for those lonely that they may find relationships, for those fearful that they may be given confidence for the doubtful that they may have faith, for those cynical that they may find experience and finally trust, and for all children and young people that they may be kept from harmful ways until they are wise enough to withstand temptation. Grant unto your church courage and strength and endurance. Help us to covet your leadership above riches and power and earthly approval. Teach us to find you in quietness and follow you in faithfulness. And we shall praise you with the angels and the archangels forever and ever. Our hearts beat faster, and our adrenaline flows more heavily at this time of year, O oh Lord. We respond to the lights and the decorations, to the cheerful, beautiful music, to the prospects of gifts and brightly decked homes and parties and friends and relatives coming to call. But let us not forget, O oh Lord, that the origin of all joy is in your love and your self-giving, which were made known most completely in Jesus Christ. Teach us to be still and get in touch with that joy. Let it flow through us like some eternal medicine, healing our hurts and wounds and illnesses. Let it perform, uh, let it perfume the air that we breathe, filling us with its sweetness. Let it ring through the corridors of our minds like heavenly bells, telling and tolling happiness and fellowship and a peace that we have never really known. And when we have felt it, when it has flowed through us 
and around us and rung in our minds like bells. Let it move out over the world, converting people, converting hate into love and greed into generosity and ignorance into enlightenment and strife into peace. Teach this, uh, touch the sick with healing. Grant mercy to those driven. Open the arms of the shy and retiring. Show blessedness to the broken in heart and let the song of the angels be our song as we are drawn together in the name of him who was born and died in Judea to save the world from its sin. He who taught us to pray, joining our voices together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand. Please stand. Now, I uh, mentioned it already. I'll go over to the fellowship hall, find a seat, and then we will have a brief prayer. And um, I understand there's a huge cake, so I'm looking forward to that. And, uh, and we'll share uh, some fellowship over there. Are you excited? Yeah. 
Yes. Christmas Eve is going to be something very special this year because of the music that is going to be done. I've already mentioned some of it, but I just feel like Christmas Eve is the time when you just come and relax. And you know, come as you are. There's two services. One is at 4:30, and that's uh, something different on that one. Charlie will be playing organ with Tim and uh, doing several things during the service for them. And then seven o'clock, of course, it's dark at that point, and there's candlelight for both of them. Uh, Silent night at the end. So it's, it's a tradition at the church to do it, and it's one of my very, very favorites. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you and all the great music. <coughs> Excuse me. So before you go, greet those who've been worshiping with you on your pew. Welcome them in the name of Jesus Christ. Deborah and I will see you over at the fellowship hall, so you can leave un unimpeded and go over there right now, and we will uh, look forward to seeing you there. So receive now the benediction of our Lord Jesus Christ. As he goes before you and follows after you and leads you.